So we'll go ahead, I think, dive in and then folks can folks can catch up later. Um, any any uh, lead questions or initial things? We did not have a chapter to read this week, so you may not have had the same number of questions, but you may have. So, or maybe some general question that you wanted to ask over the whole thing. So, what's what's on your minds? Anything? Everybody's quiet. Muted and mute. Uh, okay. All right. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Um, well, we'll talk again at the end, but one of the suggestions for next year, uh, for next fall, is that what if we continued? What if we, we've kind of looked at the history of the Hebrew people and their scripture uh, from minus, you know, 2000 plus all the way up to zero, basically, or there's no zero, uh, one, up to the year one. Uh, we'll actually go a little past the year one today. But um, somebody asked about, could we do this and continue on to 2021? AD uh, and talk about not only New Testament times, but the history of the Christian church. And so I'm thinking about that uh, and that might be a good thing for us to do in the fall, but uh, keep that, roll that around your heads for a few minutes and we'll hopefully come back to it at the, at the end. Well, I'm gonna pull up the uh, PowerPoint here if nobody's got anything else. Just here. Yes. All right, well, this is our last session. This is an added session. This is not covered in the textbook. And so uh, we're not, we're not gonna have a, a book chapter today to deal with, but just wanted to kind of not leave us hanging, but to bridge us over to the New Testament. We, we've been in the, the Hellenistic world, we've been in the Maccabean period uh, or the Hasmonean dynasty period. Uh, so how do, we get, how do we get from there up to Jesus, up to Roman, Roman times, up to the New Testament times? So that's one question I want to tackle today. The other question is, I also wanna mention uh, for a little bit, not long, long discussion, but those groups uh, in Israel that kind of formed in Maccabean times, three of these four formed in Maccabean times or maybe earlier. Uh, the Zealots were a little bit later. Uh, they were in reaction to Rome. But I wanna talk about those uh, New Testament groups as well. So that's kind of my game plan today uh, to, get us, to get us over the, over the BC AD divide and uh, get, us, get us to New Testament period here. So come back, we'll come back to this. Uh, we've had this before, the 10,000 view, view of empires controlling the Levant area. And right now we're down in this area. We've got the Hellenistic Empire overlaying the Levant, and then we've got Rome coming up. And so I wanted to uh, deal with that. And I want to talk about this period a little more in detail. Th these are pretty broad strokes here, uh, that Alexander the Great comes in 333, and Hellenistic Greek more or less lasts till 31 in Israel, uh, and then the Romans take over. Uh, but I want to give us a little more fine-grained detail than that because this, this can leave a misperception uh, that Greece fell, perhaps, in uh, 31. And that couldn't be further from the truth. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so it's not just that Rome takes over Greece in 31. Uh, we're just really, this is the overlay or the map or who's in control of the Levant. Greece actually got wiped out by Rome long before that, but the Hellenistic Greek culture carried on in the Levant. Uh, as separate kingdoms. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a second here. All right, so we've, we've got this uh, situation here that the Greeks are in charge until 31 BC. And we need to nuance that a little bit too. Really, what we're talking about here is there's kind of a transitional time of power between 63 and 31 in the Holy Land Levant region. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in some detail as well. So, you know, when you have the rough sketch, you do rough numbers, but we'll, we'll fine grain and fine tune this a little bit. All right, last week we had talked about the Seleucid or Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Kingdom, or two weeks ago we talked about this, and how the Seleucid, these were remnants of Alexander's empire. When he died, his generals divided things up. 
and uh, basically four big players were left. And this is about the year 217 here that this map applies to. Uh, Greece is under control of Macedonia. It's Alexander's Greece, basically. But it's independent from the Seleucid Empire, independent from the Ptolemaic Kingdom, even though they all share common culture. Uh, they are three independent groups here at this point. Uh, but I, I wanted to look at this map. And last time we talked about the, Seleuc the Seleucids a couple decades later would take over uh, Israel from the Ptolemies. And we looked at all that two weeks ago, the Maccabean revolt, all that stuff. But the same map, if you pull out, also has another player in 217 BC, actually a couple more players. And Greece is not just sitting here uh, all by itself in isolation. Rome is very much on the rise. Now, Rome's eyes are turned towards the Western Mediterranean at this point. Uh, their big enemy is right across the Mediterranean from them, pretty close distance-wise, even though it's North Africa, uh, the great Carthaginian Empire. And during this period, Rome is embroiled with a series of wars with Carthage, the Punic Wars. You may remember some of these things. Uh, Rome attacks Carthage. Uh, Hannibal later on tries to bring elephants up around this way over the Alps uh, to attack Rome from the north. Uh, elephants don't do too well in uh, the Alps, uh, but it was a great it was a great thinking outside the box uh, question. But anyway, Rome is not so worried about what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean at this point because it's its eyes are turned to the west, but that will shift as time goes on. So this is 217, Rome and Carthage are still fighting out. Um, but then Rome defeats Carthage. Uh, 202 BC uh, is one of the uh, great, great uh, battles here in Carthage. And so Rome takes over North Africa, Carthage area, and it eventually expands into Spanish Carthaginian territory. And then it turns its mind, its eyes to the east and takes over Greece. And Greece falls, I don't know if you can see this, but Greece falls in 148 BC. So during the Maccabean time, when the Maccabees are fighting the Seleucid Empire over here, Rome has already taken Greece off the map as far as an independent country. So the irony of this is that this area carries on as a Greek uh, region, a Hellenistic Greek cultural region, but Greece is already under the thumb of Rome uh, in 148 BC. So just wanted to nuance that. And then uh, if you look, notice there's even some green territory that's added in the 50 years after that. Uh, Rome kind of connects the dots here in Southern France. Uh, they take over what we would call Turkey, but these are really Greek, uh, Greek city-states and colonies over here on the Eastern side of, uh, of the uh, Aegean Sea here. So Rome is pushing by stages further and further east. And if we go to the next map after that, Rome pushes even further. Uh, they start to push up towards France. We don't care about that for us and they expand in North Africa. But for our purposes, uh, they take over more of uh, the Middle East. Uh, they even push, this is Seleucid territory here, eventually take over uh, Syria and then take over kind of the core uh, areas here of the Seleucid Empire and Egypt. So if you notice, where's kind of the last place on the map? So if Rome, Rome kind of starts this way and then starts coming this way and this way, kind of a double pincher movement, kind of the last area on their radar screen is Jerusalem. It's kind of, it's getting closed in from both angles, both sides, but they're kind of the last to fall in this Mediterranean region. Of course, the Romans are also fighting in France. They'll have battles in Germany. Britain is going to be on the radar screen soon. But as far as the Middle East Holy Land area is concerned, Jerusalem is actually one of the last places to really kind of come under the Roman wing. It really is kind of the, the backwater of the Roman Empire to the southeast. There are some barbarians to the north, but in the southeast, this really is kind of the edge of the empire moving forward. So we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, as we go here. All right, so Judea at this time, we're under the Hasmonean dynasty. We talked about that. They started rebelling against uh, the Seleucid Empire in the, the 170s and 160s they were fighting. Uh, so they were really, uh, as, a, as a dynasty founded by uh, Judas Maccabeus, his father, and then continued by Judas and by his brothers, Judah the Hammer Maccabee, uh, they're fighting the Seleucids. 
uh, they actually gained some semi-independence as a vassal under the Seleucids from uh, 140 to 110. And then they are fully independent from the Seleucids as a standalone kingdom from 110 to 63. We talked about a little of that two weeks ago. So the, the, the Jews have a brief period here, um, 47 years when they are independent more or less. There's some players around them and Rome is on the way, but they have this little blip of uh, some, some freedom. They get out from under the Seleucids and Rome has not quite arrived yet. So this little brief shining moment of independence. So 47 years is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that's a, it's a fair amount of time. Uh, so they have this independence here at that point. All right, but then they become a client state of Rome, Pompey the Great. Uh, yes, the city of Pompey with Vesuvius and all his name for Pompey the Great. Um, the, Pompey conquers Jerusalem in 63 uh, BC, and they're kind of under the Roman wing more or less, even though they're on the far edge of the Roman Empire uh, through 40. But Rome uh, hasn't quite consolidated power down there in the southeast yet. They're having some issues. Uh, and for a brief, brief period, for just a few years, uh, Judea actually falls under the Parthian Empire and is not under Rome uh, for, for that period. So it's kind of complex here. Parthians, who are the Parthians? Uh, we talked about them back in March. Uh, remember the Persians were formed from a, a consolidation of Elamites and Persians and Parthians and Medes, all the tribes, uh, tribal groups in what we call Iran today. So the Parthians are part of this greater Iranian uh, area. Persia has fallen uh, long since. Uh, they fell to the Greeks in 333, but these, these people are still around here at that time. And even a century later during the book of Acts, uh, Acts talks about Parthians, Medes, and Elamites all showing up in Jerusalem uh, at, at Passover, at Pentecost, at Pentecost. And remember we talked about a few couple months ago the skill and the toughness of the Parthians. Uh, they had these uh, horse bowmen. Uh, they also had some uh, armory cavalry and that made them very tough. And we had mentioned that the Romans never quite took over Parthia. They, they tried to fight Parthia but the Parthians were kind of too tough. And so they said, okay, the empire boundary stops here. We're not gonna to try to take Parthia. And we had talked about one particular battle. Uh, the Roman legions suffered 80% ca casualties against the uh, Parthians. We'll talk about that in a minute here. All right, so we've got uh, the Hasmonean dynasty kind of ruling, uh, seeking independence for 25 years kind of being uh, a client state for 30 years and then having some independence for 47 years and then being under Rome as a client and then uh, as a, a client state of Parthia. Uh, so the Hasmoneans are, are kind of wrestling with all these changing, shifting geopolitical uh, things that are happening in their world here. Uh, and I say through the year 37, we'll come back to 37 momentarily. All right, so far so good. Any, any questions or thoughts so far? All right, so focusing in on the Levant here with Rome coming in, uh, as we said a moment ago, General Pompey the Great conquers Jerusalem in 63 AD. And for the very first time, 63 is the first time Rome exerts its power that far to the Southeast. It doesn't consolidate it till 37, or really till 31 in some ways. Uh, but it's, it's starting the process of Romanizing uh, this southeast corner of the Mediterranean. And uh, Pompey is famous for being really doing a sleazy tactic. Uh, he decides since the Jews are observing the Sabbath that he is gonna send battering rams uh, on the Sabbath day and do some prep work, uh, weaken the walls. I have a real battle on the Sabbath because uh, that would probably force the Jews to come out and fight even though it's the Sabbath. But if we just send our battering rams up and start uh, pounding on the walls a little bit today, maybe they'll stay uh, in Sabbath mode. And they do, uh, strangely enough. And so Pompey weakens the walls on the Sabbath and attacks uh, right after the Sabbath is over. And so he uh, takes Jerusalem in that way. And Pompey lets the Hasmonean state continue on, but only in its southern portion, in this blue part on the map. The Jewish dynasty can continue to rule as a client of Rome, but the north uh, is split off to different jurisdictions of, of the Roman Empire. So uh, yes, yes, the Hasmoneans are still on the throne, but they're under Rome's thumb and it's less area 
than they had just even a, a couple decades ago as an independent kingdom. All right, so clients say the Roman Republic is the period we're in. Uh, just quick Roman history. You may remember this from movies or from uh, TV shows or from your school studies. But Pompey goes back to Rome, and at this time, they form what's called the Triumvirate, a, a, triple, a triple rule uh, with three people, Pompey and Julius Caesar and Crassus. So we've got three people uh, sharing the rule of Rome. Uh, Crassus is the one who tries to take over Parthia and disastrous results. He's killed, 80% of his legion is wiped out. So the triumvirate is down to two, Pompey and Caesar. And then Caesar and Pompey have a uh, falling out and it actually happens after uh, Caesar's daughter slash Pompey's wife dies. Uh, Caesar is Pompey's father-in-law even though his son-in-law is five or six years older than he is. Uh, but Pompey is married, married to Caesar's daughter. Uh, but after, after you know, to try to cement this alliance and all that, but after she's dead, uh, things start to fall apart between these two guys. And so the, the, young, the older son-in-law and the younger father-in-law uh, start, to, start to really uh, tangle with each other. And uh, eventually it's a full-blown civil war. You may have remembered Caesar brings his army across the Rubicon River. Uh, generals, Roman generals were not allowed to bring their Roman armies that close to Rome. Uh, Caesar does. And so that's basically a declaration of war against Pompey. He crosses the Rubicon uh, with his army. And so the two of them are going at it. Uh, Pompey, Pompey runs away and tries to consolidate his army. And they have some battles in Egypt. Uh, Pompey is betrayed and killed by uh, some folks in Egypt in 48. And then, so we're down to one, but it's fairly short-lived because Caesar is taken out in 44. So the triumvirate uh, goes to two, goes to one, and then goes to zero. Uh, Caesar is laying bleeding uh, and dead on the floor of the Roman, uh, uh, in, in the Roman Forum area, whichever building that was that he got assassinated in the Senate building, I think, but don't quote me on that. So now we've got a vacuum. Uh, the triumvirate is from three to two to one to zero. And so the vacuum is filled in. Um, there's a new civil war. Uh, the two lead assassins, Brutus and Cassius, uh, fight against a new trio, a new triumvirate formed by Octavian and Mark Anthony and Lepidus. We don't, Lepidus doesn't hit our radar screen, but Mark Anthony we know from uh, Hollywood movies. And Octavian is Julius Caesar's nephew. And since Caesar had no son, he adopted his nephew as his son as well. So he's, he is a blood relative more or less, uh, but he also becomes Caesar's adopted son. So nephew and son. So civil war uh, breaks out after Caesar's assassination. A couple of years later, there's a big final battle at Philippi over in Greece. Uh, Brutus and Cassius are taken out. Uh, Shakespeare has Mark Anthony saying, this was the noblest Roman of them all. Uh, great, great moment in that play. Uh, but they're, they're off the picture. So the Civil War with three, two versus three, the two are gone. And now you've got this triumvirate, Octavian, Mark Anthony, and Lepidus, new triumvirate. Okay, so during this client state period, while Rome is more or less in charge of the Levant, all this mess is going on. So they're not doing much in Judah or what we would call Israel. The Holy Land is kind of left to its own devices in some ways. Yeah, it's under the Roman umbrella. But with all this civil war going on, uh, they're pretty much left alone to their own devices here. So that's kind of that early period of Roman domination. All right, so after, after Brutus and Cassius are killed, we've got this new triumvirate. Uh, and uh, first, Lepidus falls out of favor. He gets exiled in 36. And uh, as you might expect, uh, Mark Anthony and Caesar, Mark Anthony and Octavian uh, have a falling out as well. Uh, and they, they fight a war. Uh, Mark Anthony allies with Cleopatra the seventh. Uh, and this is, you know, this is the Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton characters uh, from the movie. And eventually they have a defeat at the Battle of Actium in 31 and they retreat to Egypt and Caesar, Octavian chases them down that way. And eventually they commit suicide and are dead in 30. So first triumvirate window down to just Julius Caesar, second triumvirate windows down to just Octavian. Uh, Julius's son, heir, uh, and nephew, adopted son. Uh, so Octavian stands alone after all this mess. And uh, he decides he's going to take the family name of Caesar uh, as his name. And uh, he's bestowed the title Augustus, 
the August one, the, 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 the high exalted one. So Caesar Augustus uh, is Octavian. Uh, so Octavian assumes that role and uh, becomes basically expands his powers and for de facto becomes the first emperor of Rome, the first real Caesar of Rome, as we would understand that. Uh, he was a slick political character. He always was denying that he was after anything. Uh, he didn't want any titles. Oh, you, you want to give me that title? Well, that's fine. I guess I'll take it. But really, I'm just a humble, a humble man. Uh, but when the dust clears, he's calling the shots and he is de facto the first emperor, the first real, what we would call Caesar. Uh, his uncle Julius had the name, but Augustus has the power. And his heirs exercised that power for centuries. I mean, this is, this is the start of the Roman Empire versus the Roman Republic. Octavian, uh, Julius, Augustus Caesar really, really uh, transforms Rome, even though uh, there's some nuance and stuff. When did he really become the emperor? Well, they, you know, he's, he's in charge, calling all the shots after he defeats Mark Anthony and uh, Cleopatra. And eventually he will die in 14 AD. So he's on the throne for quite a while. And uh, so he overlaps with Jesus. We know from the Christmas story, it was in the days of Caesar Augustus, Luke says, that all the world, he sound a decree. And so Augustus is still around for the first uh, couple decades of Jesus's life. And then his adopted son, Tiberius, his wife's son, uh, Tiberius will become uh, Caesar. And he's the one who's on the on the throne when Jesus is executed and, and doing his ministry. So Tiberius Caesar uh, is on top of the top of the game. So Octavian uh, gets the power, becomes Augustus, and is able to start passing it down to those whom he wants to pass it down to. Uh, and Tiberius is you know, next, and then we've got Nero, and then we've got uh, uh, Cal you've got Cal well, no, you got Caligula, then uh, Claudius, then uh, Nero. So, you know, it's, it's going to start following the family line here as dynasties are wont to do. So that's, that's why the nuance. So in Israel, we've got kind of this client state period during the Roman civil wars. And then the things break loose and they're under the Parthians. We haven't talked about that. So let's get to that real quick. And that piece of the story is tied in with Herod. Yes, King Herod from the Bible. Uh, Herod the Great will be his eventual title. But who is this Herod guy? Well, he's half Idumean and half Arab. He's not a Jew. But his dad worked for the Hasmonean dynasty, the Jewish dynasty, the Maccabean dynasty. And Herod was raised in the Jewish faith, even though he wasn't ethnically Jewish. So does that mean he's Jewish or not? Well, some people would say, yeah, if he's raised in the faith, he's Jewish. Others would say, nope, uh, ethnically, he's not Jewish. Uh, so there was some controversy and questioning over Herod's uh, real identity. Can he be king of the Jews? Uh, he's not king yet. So Idumean, what the heck is Idumea? Well, Idumea actually stems from Edom. We saw the Edomites way back in the Old Testament, during the time of Moses even. Uh, and the Edomites traced their lineage to Esau, uh, Abraham's grandson, the brother of Jacob. Uh, and Edom of it originally was kind of down in this southern area of the Negev Desert. Uh, but by the time of Herod, they had consolidated and been pushed north uh, a little bit. And so the Maroon area was Idumea uh, during Herod's time. This was you know, much earlier uh, territory. This is kind of the territory we're talking about at this point. Now, how were they pushed? Well, they were pushed by a group called the Nabataeans. Uh, you know the Nabataeans by sight, perhaps, even though you don't, may not know, um, might not know them by name. Uh, so they're in charge of this red area. They are Arabic in uh, influence. And this is an Abbottian city. If you've ever seen the movie Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, a bunch of it was filmed in these ruins of this Nabataean city of Avda, uh, which is in the Negev Desert. Uh, this is actually where the bus pulls up. And you know, the, the high priests were on scaffolding here, and Jesus is overturning the temple over here. So this, these ruins are there, uh, but they're not Jewish. They're in Israel now. But at the time, they were Nabataean territory. And the more famous Nabataean city was Petra. Uh, you see that in movies. You see that in documentaries. Uh, this beautiful city carved in the rock. Uh, you know, this, is, this is not uh, masonry here. This is rock, just like uh, Mount Rushmore. They, they pulled the rock back and carved the rock and left these buildings behind. Beautiful city. Uh, Indiana Jones uh, goes into here uh, to find the last not called Petra in the Indiana Jones movie, but 
Uh, by the way, uh, this is in Jordan now, Petra's in Jordan, and uh, Indiana Jones and Sean Connery, uh, his dad, uh, leave this building and right off in the sunset and the, the camera goes from Jordan to just south of Amarillo. Uh, that final scene is filmed uh, southeast of Amarillo near Claude. Uh, so you know, Indiana Jones uh, makes a quick trip from uh, Jordan to the Texas Panhandle. But anyway, this is, this is who the Nabataeans were. Uh, so we, we, we're semi-familiar with them. So if you may have been pushed up north here and uh, by the time the Pompeii, Pompeii conquered Judea, uh, Idumea and Judea were kind of lumped together as a uh, group, a geographical group together, kind of combined in these Roman Republic times. So Herod's Idumean, uh, but working for the Judeans, the Jews. All right, so half Idumean. Uh, so what happens to Herod? Well, who is Herod? Well, he, his dad worked for the, for the uh, Hasmoneans. And he got appointed governor of Galilee by the Romans uh, because he was kind of uh, in the greater Hasmonean court. Uh, and this was under, under Julius Caesar at that point. So Herod kind of worked for Julius Caesar for a few brief years uh, as a, a regional governor. Uh, then Herod was appointed by Mark Anthony later uh, to be kind of the assistant uh, to guard the flank of the, the Hasmonean king in Jerusalem. So Herod is given power by Romans to rule Galilee uh, or to govern Galilee. And he's later kind of made an assistant uh, for, the, for the folks in Jerusalem, the Hasmoneans down there. So works for Mark Anthony, works for Julius Caesar. So he's kind of playing, playing all kinds of sides of the field here. Uh, but then the Parthians intervene. Rome is really weak at this point. They're involved in civil war. And the Parthians kind of come in and they put a nephew on the throne, a Hasmonean nephew as king. They oust the king that's there and they put a, a nephew puppet on the throne and take over for that few brief years uh, when it's under Parthian control. And Herod flees at this point. So he runs away and hides. And uh, then in 37, uh, Mark Anthony sends Herod back with an army to recapture Jerusalem. So Herod uh, basically comes over and conquers Jerusalem again. And at that point, he becomes uh, the Roman client king of the Jews. He assumes that title. He's not Jewish, uh, at least not ethnically. He's Idumean and uh, Arab, but uh, he ass assumes the title king of the Jews. Uh, but because he wasn't ethnically Jewish, he uh, marries one of the last Hasmonean uh, people standing, a uh, Hasmonean princess, to kind of uh, bring their dynasty into his dynasty. And so he kind of, uh, is he a Hasmonean? Well, most scholars would say really he's a, the, the first of the Herodian dynasty, but he marries into the Hasmonean dynasty as well. Uh, so you can kind of think of him as Hasmonean maybe, but really uh, most historians treat this as a separate Herodian dynasty at this point. So the Hasmonean dynasty is over, even though Herod pulls a princess in uh, to solidify his rule. Uh, Herod builds a huge fort just next to the temple uh, names it the Antonia Fortress in honor of his patron, Mark Antony. Um, there's a model of it. Here's the temple complex here, and there are little gates so the Roman soldiers can flood into the temple to kind of ride herd on uh, the Jews. Uh, if you've got a Roman cohort right here, uh, militarily attached, attached literally to the temple, uh, they can get there quickly to quell a riot. That, that leaves uh, a fair amount of power in Roman hands. They also eventually would start uh, keeping the uh, high priest vestments under lock and key. And the high priest would have to come to the Romans to get his vestments out to do his services. And then he'd check them back in at the end of uh, doing whatever services. And uh, about a century ago, some little nuns were doing some work in their convent basement, had some work done, and they discovered the ruins of the courtyard of this Fortress Antonia. So you can go stand on that fortress uh, floor today. Um, in the old days, this was regarded as the place where Jesus's trial was. Archaeologically, that probably was not here. It's probably elsewhere in Jerusalem. But the traditional view is uh, Jesus was tried in this Fortress Antonia. The Pontius Pilate would have been here. It is a candidate for Jesus's trial, but perhaps not the best candidate. Uh, but when they talk about the stone pavement, stone pavement in the Gospel of John, uh, it's either this or it's the stone pavement of another palace on the other side of Jerusalem. So traditionally, this is the stone pavement, whether it actually was or not. All right, so he builds this fortress, Antonia. But then as we know, Anthony's taken out by Octavian uh, Julius Caesar. 
uh, Augustus Caesar. And so Herod has to really backpedal. Uh, he's had Julius as a, uh, he's been, worked for Julius, but then he's been working for Anthony. And uh, how is he going to function under Caesar Augustus? Well, he really backpedals. Uh, he does a bunch of things to convince Caesar of how loyal he is, including building a city uh, in Caesar's honor, uh, Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima, which becomes the Roman uh, port and the Roman capital city where the governors will eventually hang out. Uh, we've looked at the, these slides before, but uh, there's no real port in Israel. It's a flat coastline. And so they build an artificial harbor out into the Mediterranean and remnants of it are still visible. And uh, this, was, this was Herod's doing, a big building project here. Uh, you know, can still walk the ruins there. Uh, it was a happening port. This is probably where, this is where St. Paul uh, got on the boat to do his missionary trips. Uh, they still use a theater here. They've refurbished a little bit, the amphitheater. Uh, aqueducts are still visible. Uh, very, very Roman city that Caesar, that Herod builds in Caesar's honor. So Herod, Herod uh, comes out on top. He is king of the Jews and he solidifies that and he's able to convince Augustus that he'll be a loyal client king. And he stays that way for the rest of his life. Uh, he's, he's a loyal client king of Rome. Uh, personally, Herod, though, was also vicious and ruthless. I've preached about this guy before. Uh, he killed some of his sons when he perceived they were getting too strong and he thought they might make a move against him. Um, so, you know, that's pretty tough, killing your own boys. Uh, also, a high priest had a strange accident while taking a Roman bath with Herod once. Uh, reports are that Herod held his head underwater. Uh, but Herod, oh, the high priest accidentally drowned. Uh, shucks, these things just happen. Uh, so Herod was pretty vicious, uh, it's probably true. And I've shared before, Caesar Augustus said, uh, it really is safer to be Herod's pig than his son. And it even rhymes in Greek. Because uh, Herod won't eat a pig because he follows the Jewish religion, but he, he, he will kill his sons. So vicious, vicious guy. But since again, he's eth not ethnically Jewish and a little bit suspect, he throws an enormous amount of money to refurbish the Jewish temple. Uh, if you remember, the second temple was not as spiffy as Solomon's temple. Herod fixes that. Uh, the Herodian temple is not a new temple, but it's such a thorough remodel, it may as well have been. Uh, they never end the second temple, but he really, really throws some money and some work at it. And so the remodeled Herodian second temple is much, much better than the Ezra Nehemiah period temple right after the Persians. Uh, much grander and much more glorious than what Solomon built. Uh, Herod really threw the money and the work at it. And there were some claims that it was the most pretty beautiful temple in any of the, any city in the Roman Empire. Uh, the Jews had the, the prettiest temple. Now there were some others who would claim that other temples were better, but it was at least talked about as being a contender for being the best. Uh, so this is what Herod's temple looked like. Uh, just a, a big, huge white edifice uh, with gold uh, inlays, gold leaf on the thing. Just it, Josephus describes it, it when the morning sun was hitting it, the white uh, polished stone would just glow in the sunlight and the gold would glow in the sunlight. And it just looked ethereal and otherworldly, uh, a beautiful, beautiful temple. Uh, and just as a reminder, Solomon's time, uh, Jerusalem was small and the temple was up on top of the hill when he built it. Uh, Herod's time, the temple complex is much, much bigger. And a lot of that stems from Herod's rebuilding, remodeling project. And uh, to scale with each other, I tried to blow these up to exactly the same scale. Uh, Herod's temple is significantly bigger than Solomon's temple, uh, about three times the height. Uh, Abby, yeah. How come Herod's so willing to spend so much money on a, a temple? Well, he, he claims to be a Jew, and he wants to prove to the Jewish people that he is a Jew, even though he's not ethnically a Jew. And so the, the temple is the heart of Jewish worship at this point. And so, um, you know, he's got the money, uh, so he can't think of a better way to try to solidify uh, his power than to throw money at this. Well, he, shouldn't he have to send that money back to Rome? I mean, why is the why is Caesar allowing you send, him to you send some money to Rome, but you get to keep a lot. I mean, to be a good client king, uh, you know, the, the the remnant one of the remnants of the Roman system is the mafia. Uh, the mafia <laughs> still operates under a Roman system. And so everything doesn't go to the Godfather. Other people get their cut too and are allowed to keep a piece, but they send tribute up the line, uh, send a percentage up the line to the next guy 
on the higher rung of the ladder. And so Harry got to keep quite a bit, uh, but he sent some on, on to Rome. So okay. that, that was the, and that was the way the Romans, you know, they're spread out. So you wanna make sure that everybody governing all the corners of your empire is very happy uh, with the amount of money they're getting to keep. Uh, you, you don't wanna just bleed them dry. Uh, you want them to be in power to kind of quash the local populace on your behalf. And so, so he was left with plenty of money even though Rome did get a cut, a significant cut. Good question. So Herod also was responsible for a giant building expansion of the temple compound, the temple mount. Uh, the yellow is where the second temple foundation was. The temple was a building that sat here, but the courtyard was here and Herod expanded it to the green area. So this is significant uh, stuff here. So the second temple and Solomon's temple would have been on top of a small platform like this. Uh, Herod expanded it to that. Uh, so that's, that's quite the expansion of the temple compound. Fortress Antonia is up here in the corner uh, too as they're expanding. So um, in fact, you, you would go up the stairs, the main entrance to the compound was these stairs. Uh, Herod made, an, made that into a tunnel. So you go in this dark tunnel and then come up these same stairs and boom, there's the temple. It's supposed to be hugely dramatic as a way of entering the temple. Uh, you're, you're in the dark and then God's light is right there in front of you, giant building. Uh, it was supposed to be really, really impressive. Now, I've actually sat on these little steps there. Uh, it's pretty cool. Those are excavated. Father Jim, uh, yeah, Bob. I, I figure you're about to tell us, but which is which? Which part is the Wailing Wall? The Wailing Wall on these pictures sits right in here. Uh, and so the Jews, for centuries, thought this was the only remnant of the Temple Mount period. Uh, but a lot of rubble and stuff have been thrown in. I'll show you the pictures from over here. Uh, the wall, actually, they found a lot more wall. Uh, and also underground, you can walk the wall all the way up to here now. Uh, in fact, uh, we were there on the first night of Hanukkah and some Orthodox rabbis were trying to hurry us along. We were the last tour group to be touring the wall and they wanted to light the Hanukkah fire right here as close as they could to uh, the temple. And there's a little spring that uh, comes out of the temple wall, God's tears eternally flowing. Uh, but you know, anyway. Uh, this little spring here. But anyway, you can, there's a lot more wailing wall now than they thought of uh, 150 years ago. They thought this was the only chunk left uh, with excavation. There's an enormous amount of wall still there, but this was the traditional wailing wall here. So good, good question. Or here in this picture. Uh, Herod built a bridge for the priests so priests could come from their neighborhood not to mix with the people below. I mean, it really, it was a fancy, fancy schmancy temple. Uh, today, the Dome of the Rock sits right over where Herod's, uh, where the temple probably was. Uh, there's also this mosque here, the al Aska Mosque, which is actually much more important to Muslims than the Dome of the Rock is. This is prettier, uh, but this is the important one up here. This is the third holiest site in Islam here, uh, after Mecca and Medina. Uh, so it's, uh, and there was just a riot in these courtyards. I saw news uh, photos from Friday or Saturday, uh, the riot in this courtyard here. Uh, this is right down here. This is actually rubble when the Romans destroyed the temple walls on top of the temple mount. They cast these stones down to the valley below. Uh, and those are, those are just recently excavated like in the uh, 80s or 90s, I think. Uh, fairly, fairly recent. But these blocks here are Herod blocks. Uh, you can tell by the grooves. They kind of trim down. Let's see. I've, yeah, I've got a closer picture here. Uh, they kind of make the edges indented just a little bit. So it's very clear where the Herodian blocks are. And these stones here, they estimate are about 160,000 pounds. And we don't have a crane that can move them today. They're too big for modern cranes to move. Uh, so how'd they get them there? Well, they cored them up higher on the hill and rolled them down on logs. Uh, real low tech solution, but these giant stones uh, were used to expand the foundation of the temple here. It's a huge building project. And I've shown these pictures before. Um, there's the Temple Mount, Herod's footprint next to Jones Stadium and next to St. Paul's down here. Uh, really in Lubbock, the only thing close in size is the South Plains Mall. Uh, that's really the size and shape more or less of the Temple Mount. It's a big size, big size compound. And Herod's responsible for the current footprint of it here. Uh, so there, there it is. All right, so Herod was still king at the time of the Gospels. Uh, time of Jesus's birth, Matthew and Luke both mentioned Herod being in charge and on the throne. We know Herod died in 4 BC four years before Christ, quote unquote. 
Uh, how is that possible? How is Jesus? How is Jesus born? Uh, are they wrong about Harold? Probably not. What's probably incorrect is the later monk uh, Dionysus the Short uh, probably was off by a few years when he did the calculation of when the calendar should be reset, A.D. and B.C. Uh, without Google, just basing it off old manuscripts, he died, he really did a pretty close job. But Herod died 4 B.C. So Jesus is probably born four or five or maybe six, some scholars say seven BC. So somewhere in that range, four to seven BC was when Jesus was born, but very much still under Herod's control. Uh, after Herod died, they split his kingdom up uh, between three sons and a nephew. Uh, one son, Herod Antipas, was in control of Galilee and the Transjordan, which uh, is the east of the Jordan River. And uh, he was still there when Jesus's ministry was going on. This is the Herod of the Jesus stories. This is the Herod that sings in uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. This is the Herod that uh, has John the Baptist. So he's there. This is the Herod in the Gospels, Herod's son, Herod Antipas. Uh, the son in charge of the southern area was so incompetent, though, that the Romans a few years later came in and replaced him with a military governor. And so Herod's son, Herod Antipas, controlled part of Herod's old territory, but the Romans took over Jerusalem and Judea and Idumea and kind of that southern area. And so they had a, set, a series of governors. Pontius Pilate was one of these governors of the south. So that's why you have the uh, passing of the buck with Jesus, because Pontius Pilate's in charge of Jerusalem. Uh, Herod Antipas is in charge of Galilee in the north. Uh, he says, oh, you're from Galilee. Well, go let Herod try you in Jesus's passion. And Herod says, no, send him back to Pilate. Uh, hot potato passing him back and forth. But that's why we have two different uh, guys in charge of that area. The questions here before I dive just for a few moments into Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, all that. All right, there'll be other Herods later on. There are some Herods uh, that'll be in the book of Acts. Uh, Herod, Herod Agrippa, and then uh, Agrippa, uh, son, a grandson and great-grandson of King Herod. So that dynasty will continue on for a little while, for a while longer. I want to talk just very briefly about three groups mentioned in the New Testament and four mentioned by Josephus. Uh, the three in the New Testament are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Zealots. And Josephus talks about four parties, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, and Essenes in uh, New Testament times. Josephus is writing about the 70s, so a little bit after Jesus's time, uh, he was a Jewish historian. So let's start with the Essenes. The Essenes started probably in pre-Maccabean times. Uh, it looked like they had, uh, they, they were a group of priests who did not like the Sadducee group of priests. They leaned more towards the, Sar the Pharisees, but then they had a rift with the Sadducean party of the priesthood. And they said, to heck with you, to heck with the temple. We're going to go off. This is so corrupt. You all are so awful, so evil. We're going to separate ourselves out from the temple establishment in Jerusalem. So they headed out in the desert. They basically dropped out and formed a commune in the desert, basically. Uh, and they'd really be a historical footnote, uh, except for one major accident in history. That in 1948, their library was discovered. Uh, the, the fabulous, famous, amazing Dead Sea Scrolls. This was the library of the Essenes who uh, went off into the desert. Um, here's the Dead Sea over here. Uh, Here's where Qumran, their monastery in the, in the desert was. Uh, there's the parking lot, the modern museum, but here's the ruins of Qumran. And you see their little hills and caves here. Here's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in these caves. Uh, the, the Essenes were hyper, hyper Jewish. Uh, they would engage in all sorts of ritual baths and purity exercises. And so you go there and there are these ritual baths all over, the, all over their monastery. And you can look at the ruins of that. Uh, very hyper picky Jewish. And here's the cave where the first Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. As the story goes, an Arab shepherd boy was throwing rocks into the cave and heard the rocks uh, clinking on the ground. And then he heard a crash, uh, like something got like pottery getting broken because it was pottery getting broken. And uh, they went and discovered these scrolls in these jars. Uh, this is one of the jars here, pottery jar with a lid. And uh, in Jerusalem, I built a museum, and the top of the museum dome looks like the lid of one of these jars. So, and inside this particular uh, part of the museum, uh, they've got a, a Torah scroll, big Torah scroll with an almost complete version of the Book of Isaiah on it. Uh, famous, famous discovery. Uh, 
of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there are lots of other texts uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They, they translated the big stuff first, then they had stuff that looked like this. Now they are dealing with little tiny pieces of parchment or papyrus are about yay big uh, and trying to jigsaw puzzle those back together as best they can. Uh, it's like putting together confetti uh, or something that's been through a shredder. Uh, but that's you know, after you know, 70 years later now, so there's still work being done on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we're down to trying to link up the pieces of confetti. Uh, they've, they've dealt with the bigger pieces of the library. So the Essenes uh, probably were not mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, there are some conjectures that Jesus may have hung out there for a while. That's not so convincing. There is a better case you can make that John the Baptist was taken under their wing for a while. He and the Essenes share a lot in common. And the Essenes were also known for adopting orphaned priests. Uh, John was of a priestly family, but in Luke, uh, we were told his parents were very old. It's likely he may have been orphaned fairly early. It's possible the Essenes adopted him and raised him in their monastery, and then he went off and did things later. Uh, a lot of what John does is Essene-like. So there's, there's a decent case that can be made for that. If there's no proof of it, but you can, you can make a decent argument, uh, conjecture there. Pharisees. Pharisees are pretty big in the New Testament. Uh, some date the Pharisees all the way back to the Babylonian exile. That's a little more conjecture, but they are certainly a very solid group and their power really is rising during the Maccabean period. Uh, they are very much on history's radar screen at that point. So in the, in the 100s BC, so a couple hundred years before Jesus, the Pharisaic movement is really starting to roll, uh, though their actual origins disputed in the mists of time. Uh, the Pharisees were a group who worshipped in the temple, but they also uh, wanted Torah to be studied out in the countryside amongst in the other villages and towns and cities of Judaism. And so they, they invented synagogues. So you get 10 guys together, you can form a synagogue to study Torah. So yeah, go to the temple for sacrifices on the appointed feast days, but the rest of the time hang out in the synagogue and pray. That was what the Pharisees were all about. They also stressed that all Jews should be following these purity laws, not just the priests. The, there was the Sadducee group argued these rules are just for the priests. No, all of us Jews should be observing kosher dietary laws and all of that, uh, observing the Sabbath. Uh, so the Pharisees were big about pushing that for lay people. It was actually a heavily, there were a lot of, there were some priests that were involved with the Pharisees, but there were a lot of lay folks. There's a heavy lay involved movement here, a renewal movement for Judaism in some ways. Um, and we don't think of them this way because they're the enemies of Jesus, but they were kind of the liberal wing of Judaism, progressive, uh, with the Sadducees being more conservative. And the Pharisees believed very solidly by Jesus's time in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, we already saw that developing uh, a little bit earlier in the Old Testament, towards the end of the Old Testament writings of the Apocrypha. And I've said before, Jesus had more in common with them than any other group in Israel. Uh, probably 99, 95% overlap with their theology. Uh, where he did not like them uh, was their rigidity about observing the law. He pushed back hard on them there. But don't think Jesus rejected uh, Phariseeism. He rejected a slice uh, of 5 or 10% of Phariseeism. He agreed with them on a lot of other stuff. And uh, because they were based, their power base was in the synagogues rather than the temple, even though they show up at the temple for high holy days, uh, when the temple was destroyed in 70, the Sadducees who were tied to the temple kind of disappeared from history, and the Pharisaic movement was the only one that really continued on in Judaism. And so modern Judaism stems from the Pharisaic uh, rabbis and teachings and movement and writings and all that, more or less. Uh, modern rabbinic Judaism is an outgrowth, an evolution of Pharisaic Judaism. So they're, they're in a way, they're still around. They've, they've evolved and morphed quite a bit uh, since then, but uh, they're, they're in that lineage, very much so today. The Sadducees, real briefly here, the Sadducees were, were small. They didn't welcome a bunch of uh, lay people. They didn't care about lay people. Uh, they were mainly made up of priests. Not all priests were Sadducees, but the Sadducees were mainly priests. Uh, they were wealthy, they were powerful, and they centered their power on the temple. And uh, and you know they, they centered it on the priesthood and the, the part of the priesthood, the Zadok priesthood that went back to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Persian period. So they got their name from the Zadoxes, the Sadducees. Um, and because they're hooked in the temple uh, and tied to the priesthood, 
though there were a few Pharisee high priests and priests, but they were, they were rare. Uh, the Sadducees' main motivation was protecting the temple at any cost. Whatever it takes, we will protect the temple. Uh, giving Rome the priestly vestments to take care of, fine. Uh, quelling any kind of rebellion, fine. Trying to ride her on any trouble from the peasants out in the countryside, fine. Whatever it takes to defend the temple, we will do. Uh, I said before, the temple was very lucrative for the Pharisees. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, a year in our, our economy, uh, just very profit. I mean, just uh, hugely, hugely uh, uh, monetarily uh, beneficial to them. The Sadducees were extremely conservative, though. Uh, they only said there are only five books of scripture. Remember, the Jewish Old Testament had not been developed at this point. The, the Pharisees said, said there are a bunch of writings that we look at. The Sadducees said there are five, the Torah. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The ones that talk about the priesthood and all, uh, that's, that's what we want. We don't want those prophets that uh, talk about the priest in negative terms. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, that's not scripture. Pfft, that's later stuff. Uh, these five books are it. Um, they did not believe in the resurrection. It's not mentioned in the Torah. And so it can't be real if it's not in the Torah. Uh, and St. Paul uh, exploited that fact when he was put on trial before the Sanhedrin, which had Pharisees and Sadducees sitting on it. And he said, well, I'm here. Why am I here? Well, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the Pharisees say, oh, we got no problem with that. And the Sadducees say, oh, he's horrible. And they start fighting with each other. So Paul uses this as a wedge issue between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And to a lesser extent, Jesus also uses it. Uh, when he's debating in the temple with various groups, uh, he tries to drive a wedge there between Pharisees and Sadducees. But as I said, when the temple was destroyed, that was it for the Sadducees' power center, and they are lost to history now. Uh, they did not continue on. Real quick, the Zealots. Uh, it's the only group in this big four that weren't part, didn't start BC during the Hasmonean period or weren't rolling during the Hasmonean period. Uh, they were simply a resistance movement to the Roman Empire. Uh, they advocated the armed overthrow of Rome, and one subgroup of them was a group of terrorists called the Sicarii or the Dagger Men, uh, who, who advocated not just fighting the Romans militarily, but also assassinating any Roman you could pick off from the herd. If a Roman soldier was drunk and wandering home, let's knife him. Uh, one less Roman, the only good Romans are dead Romans. Um, and there is a theory out there that Judas Iscariot was one of the Sicarii. Uh, it could also be his name Iscariot comes from Carioth, a geographical name. Uh, there are some lesser uh, things. Iscariot also sounds like liar or choking in Aramaic, maybe choking because he's hung or lying because he lies. I don't find that as convincing. Probably, probably it's because of Carioth, but maybe it's because he was one of these Sicarii uh, zealot terrorists. Uh, it's quite possible that Barabbas and the two guys who were supposed to be crucified with Jesus were zealots. Uh, that's probably why they were being nailed to the cross. Um, and also Jesus had a, a disciple, one of the 12, was called Simon the Zealot. Not Simon Peter, but si the other Simon, uh, Simon Zealoti, Simon the Zealot. Uh, in Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, he has a song where he's offering Jesus power and glory, earthly power and glory. And in one stage in the 2000 version, he's uh, they're pulling machine guns out of the out of the boxes to pass out. So that's very much what the zealots wanted to do, except not with machine guns. They didn't have those. But uh, overthrow of Rome was the way uh, they advocated things happening. Well, all that takes us up solidly in the New Testament times. Uh, final thoughts. Old Testament writings were the scriptures for Jesus and Paul. Uh, when they quote scripture, they're not quoting the Gospels. Those didn't exist yet. Uh, Paul's not quoting his own writings. They are quoting the, the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. And as Christians, we still believe this is the word of God for us today. And we believe that the God of the Old Testament is the God and Father of Jesus Christ. And so very important writings for us still today. And I'll give Jesus the last word here. Uh, Matthew and Luke, Jesus says in Matthew, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not come to overturn the Old Testament. I've come to fulfill it. Uh, and then in on the road to Emmaus and afterwards when he appears to his disciples after his resurrection. Uh, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Jesus very much saw himself in continuity with the Old Testament. And uh, so that's where we'll draw this to a close here. So any final thoughts or, or comments here?
one tiny um yeah jimmy uh tiny uh on the sicari the spanish word for hitman is still sicario really oh <laughs> fascinating i did not know that i survived that long wow cool yeah cool well uh next fall uh we had a suggestion that we continue on with this um timeline and look at the New Testament, but not the New Testament in detail, but the New Testament period, and then other periods of the Christian history, uh, all the way up to the 21st century. And so uh, if somebody has a better idea, let me know soon. But uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking about uh, for the fall, is to go from uh, gospel times, and then New Testament times, all the way up through, uh, through the modern world. Uh, Good idea. Okay. Well, we may pick up with that then in September. Also, since we have people like Mimi, uh, we'll probably be meeting in person in Washington Hall, but we're going to try to find a way of being able to stream these and record these because uh, we also have people that have been watching these uh, talks later. And so we're, we're going to look at, look at a way of doing that uh, for the fall as well. But we've got a few months uh, before we get ready for that. Father Jim, is there a kind of a general survey of Christian history? to read along with I have not locked in but Bob probably the one I'm leaning towards right now is this this book here Dally's uh, history of Christianity it's a uh, it's a college textbook it's got lots of pictures and graphs and maps and things uh, there are some errata in here in fact I we use this as a textbook for the SOM students uh, and I I keep emailing these errata that I find uh, so there are a few mistakes in it but they're not only a couple of them are really substantive, uh, and they were, they're they're accidents; they're not intentional. Uh, but it's it's a good it's a good book, and I think we'll, we'll probably suggest that. But I'll I'll get more information out on that. Uh, I won't wait till September on that. We'll we'll pull the trigger on on that maybe in July or so and get a schedule together and I'll let y'all know. So, oh, good question. All right, y'all. Well, we will we will close it off there then. Uh, I've enjoyed. Enjoy this. Sorry, it had to be on Zoom, and I'm looking forward to not being in Brady Bunch boxes uh, in the future. But uh, look, look down, look at the, all the Brady Bunch stuff. But anyway, uh, good to see y'all, and we will see you at some other point. Uh, take care. Well, thank Talk you for thank you so much. Thank you for opening up the scriptures for us. Well, yes. thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, y'all. Take care. Bye, bye, Jim. Bye.